Alright, fire it up. Today, we're back on Project Rolling Thunder and firing up our supercharged 4.6 Illuminator engine for the first time. And we're going to show you how to find the center of gravity of your ride. It's all today, here on Trucks. Hey guys, welcome to Trucks. Well, today is a good day because Project Rolling Thunder here, after all the work and all the time, gets fired up for the first time. Now, we're also going to show you some of the things that we've done to this vehicle since you saw it last. But just in case you're new and just in case you need a little bit of a reminder over everything that's gone into this vehicle to get it to where it is today, let's take a little trip back in time. <laughs> Our little Mazda B2500 had its four-cylinder, five-speed drivetrain yanked in favor of a dual overhead cam, 4.6-liter engine and transmission, complete with dual exhaust sticking out the side. With that done, it was time to fire it up. <laughs> Check that. Obviously, going from four-cylinder to V8 power gave us tons more horsepower and torque. But after a few miles with this junkyard engine, it sounded like there was a little man with a hammer trying to get out of the bottom end. It sounded like a worn rod bearing, and a problem like that doesn't fix itself, so we headed to the house. Now, our 32 valve, 4.6 liter dual overhead cam engine swap was a success, just a short lived one. But that's all right, it just gave us plenty of opportunity to upgrade to bigger and better things, like this illuminator topped with a Whipple supercharger and backed by a six speed Tremec manual transmission along with a whole host of other mechanical and chassis upgrades, making this pickup truck less like a Ranger and more like a Mustang. Now, a stock Mazda or Ranger frame isn't exactly the stiffest platform to build a track vehicle off of. So we added some boxing plates, complete with speed holes. Then we welded those in, along with all the cross-member junctions, to make the chassis as stiff as possible. Then we dropped in our 4.6-liter engine and six-speed manual transmission. Followed that with the installation of an independent rear suspension out of an 03 Mustang Cobra. You don't see that every day in a truck. Then it was onto the front suspension, which we moved forward five and a half inches for weight distribution. Speaking of which, that's why we put the fuel tank and the battery towards the rear of the truck. Better balance equals better handling. A heavy duty aluminum drive shaft connects our six speed gearbox to the limited slip equipped differential. After a little bit of plumbing, we reinstalled our ceramic coated factory manifolds and followed that with the installation of a completely custom stainless steel exhaust system. And since we liked the side exit, well, we kept that. But this time we went out both sides. Now to feed the supercharger, we added the cold air intake. Now to keep tabs on what's going on underneath the hood, we added a whole slew of gauges. And to keep us safe inside, well, we added a pretty robust roll cage, complete with race seats and five point harnesses. The last thing we need to do, wad this thing up on a road course and not walk away. And along with all of the mechanical and high performance modifications, we also did some pretty aggressive and extensive body mods, including making this out of this. We also showed you guys some really interesting and out of the box ways to do custom body work. Check it out. Now there's nothing wrong with the Mazda, but we like the looks of the Ranger better. So we just made it one with the help of the LMC catalog. On the bottom of the cab, we did a thick spray on thermal coating. For the front sheet metal, we stretched the wheelbase or just used two fenders to make one to accommodate the stretched wheelbase and use good old fashioned old school welding techniques to keep the welds cool and keep our sheet metal in the shape that we intended. Out back, we welded in a custom metal roll pan for a cooler smooth look. 
Now that the wheel arch was in the right place out front, we had to accommodate the stupid wide wheel and tire package. So we just did a little voodoo magic with some quarter inch steel rod, pie cutting the sheet metal, and testing it to make sure we could get articulation without rubbing. We wanted brake cooling ducts front and rear on this vehicle. So with some custom sheet metal work and some off the shelf kits, we made that happen. The air inlets on the bedside don't just look cool, they're actually styled after an old school NACA duct and force air in behind the rotor quite effectively. The front air ducts are fed with a ram air effect through the snuggly bumper into some carbon fiber inlets. In the bed is a cross brace that bolts into the roll cage and to the frame and is covered up by a new aluminum tonneau cover. Up next, we're using a pressurized oil system to get our brand new illuminator ready to fire. Stay tuned. Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Now under the hood, well, we're just about finished up. The only thing we've really got left to do is fill this engine with fluids and get a reflashed PCM installed. Now we've had a chance to get upper and lower radiator hoses on this thing, get the plumbing for the intercooler and heat exchanger taken care of, and get our supercharger drive belt on. We've also buttoned up the wiring, filled up the brake reservoir and clutch reservoir, and mounted our fuel pressure regulator to the firewall along with running all the lines. Speaking of fuel, we wanted to show you something that we've revised since the last time you saw it. We used to have the fuel cap mounted in this aluminum plate and we were going to hard mount it to the bed floor, but we got to thinking, this is going to see some pretty aggressive driving and possibly some track time. And if the event happened where something bad went down, we got into a collision. Well, now we've locked the bed and our fuel neck together. So what we did is just cut a larger hole in the floor, make a little neck on the fuel tank and isolate and mount the fuel cap right here. We've got plenty of clearance around the bed floor, and we've also ensured that there's not a spark risk right at the fuel vapor contact point by using vacuum line and some weather stripping adhesive and kind of sealed it up. It doesn't look bad, and we know we're going to be safer on the road. Now, the original Cobra independent rear suspension anti-roll bar or anti-sway bar mounted on the backside of the subframe and behind the differential, but it interfered with our coilovers, so we had to lose it. What we ended up doing was recycle the truck's original front sway bar. And we've got it installed on the front side of the differential where there's barely enough room. Now we made some custom brackets for it to hang it off the frame and picked up some PosiLink end links from Ride Tech and attached it to the lower control arm's original sway bar mount. Now this sway bar is a little bit larger diameter and has shorter arms, so it's gonna be even more effective than the stock Cobra sway bar at reducing body roll. Now our crate engine came to us brand new with zero miles on it. And I'm sure it was put together with assembly lube and all that, but it has been sitting for a couple of years, both in and out of the truck. And the last thing we want to do is turn the key for the first time and have metal to metal contact or a dry start causing a lot of engine wear. So we're going to make sure the engine oiling system is fully lubricated before we do that. We're going to be using this Goodson's pressurized pre-lubrication oil tank. Now, you guys might be a little bit more familiar with this oil pump drive shaft tool. One end hooks up to an electric drill, the other engages the oil pump, you spin it, and it circulates engine oil. But on vehicles or engines without a distributor, that's just not an option, but you still want to prime the system. Now, we've got this tank filled with a couple of quarts of Royal Purple engine break-in oil. Now, all we have to do is pressurize the tank with some air and hook this line up to a fitting near the oil filter. Now step one is disconnecting and removing our auto meter oil temperature sender and installing this brass adapter. This elbow will allow us to install another adapter that we can hook the line to. After snugging down the line, it's simply a matter of pressurizing the tank with compressed air. We took it to about 60 PSI. That. Then slowly crack the line open and let the oil flow into the engine. And since our gauge is still hooked up, we can just put our eyes on it and confirm that pressure is building in the system. Now to go with our Royal Purple synthetic engine braking oil, you guys may have noticed we're running a Royal Purple oil filter as well. And just like the oil, well, the filters are premium and they do come at a cost premium but there is a difference. Check this out. This is the filter element out of one of the most commonly found oil filters at the local parts store. 
and when comparing it to the Royal Purple filter, well, there's quite a few differences, but the biggest being the filter media itself. This is 100% synthetic and filters down to 25 microns. This one, well, it's kind of weak looking in comparison, and I'm sure it's not gonna do as good a job. And while it might be sufficient for a Honda Civic with 312,000 miles on it, well, for our $8,000 crate engine, we know what one we're going with. When we come back, we'll show you how to find the actual center of gravity on your ride. Stick around. Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Now, we've showed you what we did for an anti-roll bar or sway bar on the rear of this pickup truck but we haven't shown you anything up front. That's because we haven't installed one yet. Now, when selecting a sway bar for this custom application, well, we don't wanna just grab one out of a catalog or go with what our buddy runs down the street. We wanna know for sure so we can get the right spring rate for it. Now, there's a few key pieces of information you need to have when selecting the correct spring rate for the sway bar. One of those being the center of gravity height. Now, you've probably heard the general rule of thumb that the center of gravity height is about where the shifter handle sits or about the height of the camshaft in the engine block. But those are probably more suited for car applications. So rather than go with a general guideline, we're going to take some measurements and know exactly where it sits on this truck. Now, the first step is to get a baseline measurement of what the truck weighs at all four corners with it fully dressed and sitting at ride height. Now the information we're really interested in is the weight over the front of the vehicle, which is about 1,826 pounds. Now for accurate results, you need to lift the back of the vehicle at least 10 inches. We went up as high as we could with our floor jack before resting it back down on the scales. We did let the pressure off the jackets, just there for insurance. Now the computer program we're using wants to know the rear axle center line. Ours is 24 inches. So by lifting up the rear of the truck about 11 and a half inches, we've got a new front weight of 1,851 pounds, an increase of 25. All right, now in addition to some of the measurements we've already taken, the software needs a few more bits of information, like the radius of the front tire, the radius of the rear tire, along with the total of the front vehicle weight and the rear vehicle weight with it sitting level, and again, the front half of the vehicle weight with it tilted up. With that entered in, let's see what we get. Now, there's a number of center of gravity calculators easily found online, but you may want to run your numbers through more than one just to verify you get the same results. And with all the info entered in, you let the magic box do all the boring math. Ours turned out to be a pretty respectable 21.7 inches. Our truck's wheelbase is about 117 and a half inches, and we've got about a 54% front weight bias. 54% of 117 and a half is about 63 and a half putting our center of gravity or center of mass 63 and a half inches in front of the rear axle center line. Now our center of gravity height turned out comparable to a lot of performance cars, which is pretty good considering we started out with a pickup truck. Now we'll take our center of gravity height measurement, combine it with our front and rear roll center heights, our spring rates, and the specs on the rear sway bar, and we can determine the correct front sway bar and we'll get the right one right out of the box instead of going through the expensive trial and error method. Now this COG height measurement is also useful in a number of other suspension and automotive calculations. So if you can get your hands on some scales, it's worth doing. After the break, we'll fire it up. Hey, welcome back to Trucks. Well, we got the computer back from Jeff and the guys at Dunride Performance, and based on the information we sent them, mass air meter specs, injector size, etc., they reflashed the computer with a tune that's going to be good and safe to start and run. Now, down the road, we can get a full chassis tune on this thing, but now we finally get to hear what it sounds like. All right, fire it up. <laughs> You've got to love the sound of a supercharger, and this thing sounds healthy. But those of you who have done major projects, well, you know that there's still a bunch of work to do on this truck. we got to nut and bolt the entire chassis. There's still a front sway bar to put on. Plus, there's several adjustments that we've got to go through and tune this thing and make it handle as good as it looks. But rest assured, we are real close to some awesome seat time and hopefully making a lot of tire smoke. <laughs> Hey 
Hey guys, if you're looking to add 556 horsepower and 551 foot-pounds of torque to your next project, we'll take a look at the LSA crate engine from GM. Now this thing's based on the powerful LS9 and features high flow cylinder heads, an aluminum block, and a forged steel crankshaft. But this one has a traditional wet sump oiling system. Now in addition to making a ton of power, it was designed and built to have a great idle qualities and instant throttle response. Heck, it even comes with its own transmission controller and wiring harness. Now if you've got a project you're working on that needs a little bit of paint work, well, there's a new option for you and a name you'll probably recognize with this Sherwin-Williams Barrett-Jackson restoration system. This color kit includes one gallon of color and hardener, so you've got enough to make five sprayable quarts. They've got kits for primer and clear coat as well. And the best thing is, well, it's all from Sherwin-Williams, so it's all compatible and you won't get any nasty surprises. And once your paint job's done, well, they've got the wash, wax, and detail products you need to keep your nice looking paint job looking nice. If you're looking to dress up your V8, well, Mr. Gasket's got just about everything you need to get the job done. They've got chrome dipsticks, shiny new valve covers with chrome breathers, got new timing covers to replace that beat up original, even new chromed timing indicators. They also include the gaskets and grommets necessary to complete the install. And Mr. Gasket products are known for being affordable. Guys, thanks for watching Trucks. See you next week.